united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Welcome to the United with Christ show. I'm your host today, Caleb Harrelson with Engage Truth Ministries. I'm so excited you have joined us today watching this show online, on TV, wherever you're watching from. I am I'm really excited about the topic that we're going to be covering today and the following weeks. And really, we are in an interesting time. We have a time of people questioning their faith. Only 4% of Gen Z um, that professes to be a Christian has a biblical worldview. So we're in a time where both deconstruction um, people questioning and, and, and rejecting the core tenets of the faith and a lot of cultural confusion. But you know what's amazing is God's word is a solid rock of a foundation to, to anchor our soul. And what I want to do to start off the show is I want to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And then we're going to open up with a word of prayer and I'll get to our topic for today and introduce our guests. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray in response to that reading. Dear Lord, we do pray today for everyone watching this show that they would establish in their hearts and would prepare their mind for action to have clear thinking and to fully set their hope on the grace brought through Christ alone. I pray that anyone watching today would see the glorious gospel of what you have done to rescue, rescue hopelessly lost sinners through the perfect work of Christ alone and that they would trust in you today. And that as we um, talk about cultural topics, that we would um, discuss them with honesty and, and pointing to you and the sufficiency of your word. And it's the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm so excited to introduce you guys to uh, my guest today, uh, Jason Kearns. He is uh, one of the pastors at Sun City Church and also our co-director at our uh, summer camp, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So welcome to the show, Jason. Hey, thank you, Caleb. I'm glad to be here. Um, and as Caleb said, my name is Jason Kearns. I'm one of the lay elders at Sun City Church on the Far East. So if you're in that area, feel free. Uh, come on out, 1030 Sunday morning. Uh, just look us up on, on Google. But a little bit about me, uh, like what we, we talked about, was that I grew up in a solid church, mm. but I didn't really take my faith seriously until I, I was in my mid-20s. And God actually used an unbeliever to bring it to my attention. Mm. I wasn't taking my faith seriously. And instead of deconstructing, yeah. which is what a lot of people do today, I, I began to examine my faith right. um, through the lens of scripture and uh, through God's providence. Uh, I'm here in El Paso yeah. preaching the word. <laughs> Amen. Well, we praise God for that. It's It's been a joy to partner with Sun City, both in our summer camp and in other avenues. I know many churches have worked with you guys and it's a wonderful uh, recent church. You guys have been around for what, four or five years? Yeah. I think four years there, now, yeah. four and a half yeah. now. Yeah, well, that's so, awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. and so, Jason, it's been a joy to get to know you, particularly in the way that we've collaborated with our summer camp. And our ministry, Engage Truth Ministries, is a nonprofit, and we focus on, on training the next generation and adults as well on, and to have a biblical worldview. Uh, we take them out for evangelism. So our ministry, we, we run a worldview academy now as of, of last year um, where we're taking students to diving into things like church history, logic, debate, uh, evangelism, apologetics. And uh, it's very interactive. And we have creation hikes and, and many other things. And, and then we have our summer camp. We have students all from the Southwest. And, you know, they're welcome from anywhere around the world as well. Uh, the last week of June at Aspendale Retreat Center, just outside of Cloudcroft, a full week. We have ages 9 through 18 where students can dive deeper, have adventure together. Um, they can dive deeper into some of the claims of culture and test it up against scripture and really get some good biblical theology, discipleship, and apologetics. Now, I've been throwing that word apologetics around and really it's, it's something every believer is called to do as we see in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have and do it with gentleness and respect. 
But it, it's, it's, it's a part of our witness bearing to the truth of the resurrected Savior. And uh, so what we're going to focus on today is really this, this issue, as you've mentioned already, is this issue of deconstruction. And um, someone watching right now can probably think of a few people that would say they're a hashtag ex-evangelical. Have you heard, seen oh, yeah. that hashtag before? All, all over. Yeah. Now, when we think of people who may fit into that category or um, those who have deconstructed, I, I can personally think of a few people that I grew up with or went to college with for undergrad that would say they've deconstructed. I don't know if you can relate with that. Oh, oh yeah. And, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit yeah. later. Yeah. And I think this issue, it's very personal because uh, there's people that we know and love that we maybe have grown up um, in church with or in youth group with, had conversations, had moving experiences at summer camp. Then we go, wait a minute, what's going on? Now, we think of it, it's not entirely new in the history of the church. It's, you know, people, sometimes we would say that are, are identifying as walking away from the faith. And of course, you have, you have these other questions that come up of, were they truly born again? Or is this a season of serious doubt? Um, but before we get into more on this defining deconstruction and what leads to that, I want to do a bit of a church history uh, backup to how we got to where we are today. And I love church history. Um, I think it's the, the story of God working through his people and also sometimes Amen. sad stories as well. Um, but when we think of like the Protestant Reformation, um, you know, a lot of people point to Luther nailing the 95 Thesis and 1517. Um, of course, it's, it's not um, really a, a new branch of Christianity. It's going back to the sources of what, it, what does scripture say and is going back to uncover the purity of the gospel that had been covered up with a bunch of traditions of man and had um, eclipsed the beauty of the gospel through grace alone. It's completely a gift and through faith and trust in Christ alone. And Luther was, uh, as he and, and grew and mature, he really articulated that, that truth of we are saved by simply trusting in the perfect work of Christ alone. Now, what you see in, in church history, you see that develop, you have guys like um, Calvin and Luther, um, Zwingli, and many other reformers reforming back to the core, pure teaching of the gospel. But then you have things that there's obviously conflict in different states, and it can, can we have peace here and um, in these states? And um, then you come to this interesting point where there, there's what we call like the 30 years war. And, you know, you may want to dive into that more. And why do I bring that up? Because Really, that, I think, led into what we call the Enlightenment, and we're still feeling the effects of the Enlightenment today. Because right after the Thirty Years' War, where you're having a lot of religious wars, instead of just debating ideas, then people are saying, maybe the authority of the Bible should be rejected altogether. And it's very much still connected with that, and people, some are saying, why do we have to debate about this? Maybe religion isn't even useful at all. And then you have these philosophers coming on as, Maybe we can understand what's true. Maybe we can understand what's right in the world by just kind of getting, uh, not starting with the Bible. And some would say they're believers, but then they wouldn't start with a scripture as grounding their understanding of what it means to be human, um, grounding their understanding of what's true based off of God's revelation. And, and then you end up coming up with things like all the way to the French Revolution, close to the American Revolution, where they're saying human reason is our ultimate standard rejecting divine revelation is the ultimate standard. And then you end up having these things where, of course, you have Darwin in 1859, Origin of Species, um, where you kind of have these questioning more of the uh, of foundation of origins. Um, so when we have this, this rise, I'm sure you've heard of J. Gresham Machen. Mm -hmm. um, you have this rise of this, this debate again of what we call the fundamentalist and the modernist controversy. And um, now, when we think of fundamental today, what fundamentalists, uh, right or wrong, what sometimes tends to come to mind in people's mind is, um, you know, sometimes maybe isolationist, uh, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if you'd add something to that. Uh, uh, not much. Other than, like, o over the years, the church has bought whole, like, just wholesale bought into this way of thinking. Yeah. And it's was completely foreign to before that time. And right. so we, 
we, within like the, the church as the whole, um, I'm not saying the solid <laughs> believing church, yeah. but, but it affects how even within the church we, we think and process through things. And it, it leads to where we are today. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's important because we may have many different viewers and they may be thinking, what's wrong with being a fundamentalist. And we're not saying in one sense that it's, that it's very, very good and biblical holding to a core essentials, if by that we mean God's word is our ultimate authority. Um, we are saved through Christ alone. There is no other uh, name under heaven which uh, men may be saved. Um, and the inerrancy meaning of God's word, meaning there's, there's no errors. Um, but what it came to be later uh, known as today is sometimes is, it's almost a retreating from culture. This may not be true of all that would identify fundamentalists today, but it became as a retreating in, of culture and not engaging with popular ideas. Um, but in J. Gresham Machen's time, uh, about 100 years ago, there was the modernist who would say, um, we don't need scripture to be entirely accurate in all the things it's addressing, inerrancy. Um, and so we have people saying things like maybe why Jesus came was uh, different things from just saving us from bad thinking or to save us to feel better, but it wasn't saving us from sin. <laughs> um, so they're redefining the core truths of Christianity. And um, then it became from guys where, um, before Machen that it was more about how we feel our religious experience and less about truth. So you, you have Machen come on the scene and, you know, there's a lot more history behind it, of course, but he writes the book Christianity and Liberalism. So now a lot of people think, well, why is, why is he title it that way? It's actually uh, really important because he's saying actually liberalism is a completely different religion. Now, when we're talking liberalism here, we're not talking political necessarily views, we're talking about a completely different view about God man and the Bible. And so I say all that, we come to today, and that's still a hundred years ago, what Machen was addressing, he's correcting those errors of what we would call today progressive Christianity, saying we need to progress beyond the historic understanding of what it means to be a human, the authority of scripture. And now we're coming to today where, um, you know, prophet Isaiah says, truth is slain in the streets now that truth is, is not the highest priority, even of those who would profess to be a believer. And so one of those being the liberal emphasis on experience, right? And I don't know if you could speak to, what are some other reasons today in 21st century America church, American church, why truth is not, doesn't seem to be as much the focus for many, even Christians? Well, you, as I said, you know, the church is bought into the, all of this post enlightenment thinking and really yeah. where we are today is is the post modern yeah. thinking which is talking about truth is relative like they yeah. don't say that there is an objective truth which is completely against what we find in scripture yeah. and so when we get disconnected from that I, you know when we come a, a, again like up to a, a hard passage in scripture and it's like oh man i, I don't really really like that. That, that. that hurts my feelings because, well, I'm one of those sinners and that offends me. So I, I can just kind of push that part out and I'm going to focus on the feel good parts yeah. and not the whole counsel of scripture. I think that is, is very much part of it is that we, when our view of God it gets so um, shifted or influenced by culture itself that it affects how we even read the Bible where we say, well, the God I would believe in and a lot of times what happens next or what they say next is something that actually ends up contradicting scripture because it's a view that God is, they say, well, my God is all love. So mm -hmm. this can't be wrong because, and you, you know, you work oh, yeah. it out, right? And so that's where you see things where hashtag evangelical, like, and they may have a problem with the doctrine of hell. Mm -hmm. um, they may have a, a problem with um, Christ laying down his life. Um, as an, an atonement, a payment for our sin. Oh, well, yeah, and even in Scripture, we, we see that the offense of yeah. Christ's sacrifice is, is, is going to be offensive to people. Yeah. Um, so this isn't even, a lot of this isn't even new to us. It, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. Right. 
Um, I, we could go back to Genesis 3 and yeah. really see where a lot of this starts at, you know, did God really say? Right. And, and we're fully living that out right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the issue where we come to say, this can't mean this in the scripture where now we have this view that uh, I think is actually uniquely Western, uh, meaning those from like Europe and North America that says we need to decolonize our faith. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard that saying a, before. A little bit. I'm, I'm yeah. still more... Uh, Familiar with the deconstruction term, yeah. but yeah. It's connected. <laughs> so now that's very much like saying it's it's through these lens that I'd say it's really a kind of influenced by enlightenment and now post-enlightenment thinkers um, that is essentially instead of saying that there's an objective truth that stands in authority over all of us, there's this thinking that says, well, really, it's just all class warfare and it's the oppressed oppressor and... Now Christianity became dominant. Now that colonized everyone um, in their thinking and the culture. And so now we need to get rid of that and throw it all off. Um, but it's, it's interesting because were there, was there mission work in the history of the church that was very much convert or, or I'm going to punish you? Sir, sure, absolutely. Um, but however, the, the core idea that it was merely merely colonizing um, faith, um, and it wasn't very much grounded in a sacrificial, loving, um, laying down your life because Christ loved me, I'm going to lay down my life like the early church. Well, that's, that's not the same concept, but we, what we see biblically is the church grew in number because they were proclaiming historical message, but this idea of decolonizing our faith actually seems to be unique to Western culture itself. I know, because if we, we start looking at Christianity as a whole, like throughout the world, what we really see is Christianity blossoming under persecution. Yeah. And so a lot of times when we look at decolonizing uh, the faith or whatever, it, it's really like false. We're looking at it through a, a skewed lens, if you will, because where's the church growing so fast? It's, it's growing in Africa. It's growing in yeah. China. Like even, even North Korea, all these persecuted places, the Middle East, Christianity's growing. It, nobody's going in there and saying, convert or die. Yeah, right. Well, at least not for Christianity anyways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, absolutely. And that's where you have guys like Tertullian in the early church. He says, as an early church father, um, he said, the blood of the martyrs, those who died proclaiming the resurrected Christ, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems very much counter to this decolonized view as well, that the church kept growing because they're saying, you're willing to lay down your life to proclaim this truth. Well, and it, that captivates, and that still captivates people's hearts today because people will die for what they think to be true. As, as my friend Jay Warner Wallace says and Frank Turek says, People die for what they think to be true, but no one dies for what they know to be false. The, who would be in a better position than the first century disciples? And so now we today, uh, in, line, uh, in line with that same testimony, um, we believe to live as Christ and to die as gain. Amen. And that's very much connected with, say, our summer camp theme. Our, our, again, our theme uh, for our camp is faithfully different. And it's really very much based off of Natasha Crane's book, uh, Faithfully Different, and I'd say biblical concepts that we see in 1 Peter. We're going to be preaching through 1 Peter um, during the week of camp. And then we have age-specific classes from all the way from nine, uh, 9 years old to 18. So we'll have preteen, middle school, and high school during camp. And then, of course, we have ropes course activities. And I think it's so important that we, we have something like this for students uh, I read another stat that was saying um, by the time students are age 13, their worldview is essentially already established. Mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes people think when they think about worldview training, which worldview is just thinking biblically about every subject or applying scripture to everything. When people think about that, it tends to be in the church very reactive. Oh, my kid deconstructed. deconstructed how can I get him apologetics? Well, a lot of, unfortunately, by that time, they don't want to listen. Um, sometimes they do, of course. Um, but let's, let's, let's talk about it as it relates to the, 
this concept of deconstruction. How are we defining that? Is this the same as just doubting your faith and having questions, or is this different? Well, yeah, it, it, it's not the same as doubting your faith. So we need okay. to be very clear on what deconstruction is. Because, and I'm going to start out with what it isn't. Yeah. What deconstruction isn't is examining what you believe to see it if it lines up with Scripture. Because that's something that, that all believers should be doing. Yeah. Um, we... Because oftentimes, you know, as we're, we're raised in the church or whatever, we should examine things like our soteriology, our eschatology, mm -hmm. uh, even our ecclesiology, all of these, these big topics to be, see if they're true. We see that in Scripture in Acts 17 with the Bereans going and examining the Scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. Yeah. And so we should be doing that. So what deconstruction isn't is... is a rethinking what you believe in light of your feelings. Yeah. We, that's something that needs to be avoided. That's that postmodern thinking. And with the stats you gave about yeah. our, our a person's worldview being set by 13, yeah. this isn't something that we address with our kids when they're in college. <laughs> this is, this is something that we need to be doing yeah. from day one. Um, yeah. it, it's because within this, it, a deconstruction it's grounded in that postmodern thinking that yeah. and this is what our kids are being raised in and even though I grew up in the post fully in the postmodern era yeah. it wasn't as widespread as what it is now so in this postmodern thinking we were if we're going to examine our faith in light of that it's there's no objective truth and also my my feelings or myself is my own authority yeah. so I can just reject stuff outright. So it, it's not faithful to scripture. It's not faithful to, to the faith once and all for hand, handed down by the saints. Amen. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's very helpful because we think about what's the standard? Is it reforming back to the scripture? Like we're talking about with the reformers themselves. Is it, is the, are my views in line with scripture or is it rejecting it? And I like, um, Elisa Childers, in one of her books, uh, recent books on the deconstruction of Christianity, talks defines it as um, really it's the questioning of your faith without Scripture as your ultimate authority, mm -hmm. with really yourself as the ultimate authority. Oh yeah, and and we know that that ourselves and in, like our sinful selves are deceitful. Our our sinful flesh wants to sin. Yeah. So apart from Christ, apart. From the Holy Spirit within us, yeah. we're we're going to tend towards that sin, um, and really, like I think, how we we see this played out in in real life examples. So, uh, for me, uh, one of my friend's daughters, when mm. she got to college, and she went to a Christian college. Yeah. Um, so, you, parents, just because you send your kid to a Christian college doesn't mean you shouldn't be checking on them. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. She she had already been hidden or struggling with hidden uh, th uh, like thoughts on sexuality and gender and stuff. She identified as asexual and it was never really ad addressed with her before that. She felt that in the Christian home she was in that, oh, I can't bring this up. Mm. Even though we, we see Paul saying, hey, if you can be single, go for it. Mm -hmm. Like that, be as I am. That way you can devote yourself fully to the church. Well, she gets to college. She's never addressed these, these issues that she's struggling with. And she's then surrounded by, by friends that have already deconstructed, that have bought in to the LGBTQ plus agenda. And they, and they convinced her, oh no, you're, you're one of us. Yeah. Because she wasn't, you didn't have a biblical view of sexuality. And so she be believed that. And then based on her feelings, well, it, then if I'm one of them, then what I, I've known to be true in scripture, uh, that, that can't be, be right. So she deconstructed based on her own feelings and yeah. not wanting to deal with her own sin. She used deconstruction as a way to escape her sin instead of running to the throne of grace. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think, this is very important. It, the The story you shared is a story I could share of many others. Mm -hmm. And I think some of them, they ch may truly believe that they are coming back to a true Christianity. And so they're still holding a label of maybe a progressive Christian, um, or they just wouldn't call themselves evangelical. Uh, but the issue is, I think, 
um, it's a redefining of the self and redefining what it means to be made in God's image. And when you think of the themes we're going to be addressing at our summer camp, our culture is saying self is God and God exists to serve us, to make us feel good. Culture is rejecting God's design and saying part of our feelings makes us who we are. Um, culture is saying rejecting the purpose of life. Scripture makes clear it's to know Christ and to make him known. They're saying the purpose of life is to have your feelings be a value and affirmed. And they're also essentially rejecting if Christianity is even good for society. And, and so then, as you mentioned, they're saying, well, what's the true authentic community? Well, it's like the counter community to the body of Christ. We say this is a community of people found around the identity of knowing and proclaiming Christ. Well, that's the body of Christ. We have these counter communities. And now as we wrap up our show here, I want us to be thinking about, and I hope you'll join us in the future weeks, and uh, I want to make sure to mention a few things. Uh, we are doing a book raffle to help um, support more students going to our summer camp. If you go to engagetruth.org, you can, uh, you can find our summer camp tab. We're doing a book raffle on a Natasha Crane's Faithfully Different book, and Jay Warner Wallace's Truth and True Crime, both excellent books, um, great apologist writers. And I, I hope people will consider joining us for camp, sending their students um, for the Engaged Truth Summer Camp. As we talk about living faithfully different, we're going to equip students now to be prepared to stand, to have their minds prepared for action so they can be faithful in an age of chaotic confusion and deconstruction. We want them to be grounded in God's word alone. Thanks for watching today. Thanks, Jason, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me um, on. It was a blast. Hope you'll join us next week on United with Christ.